Thank you, everybody, for joining us today for our latest in the series of webinars for Siemens regarding the Cinemark product line. Today we're going to be talking about program guide and specifically working with standard cycles. So as we go through, I'll, I'll define what I mean by standard cycles, and, and we're going to use a, get a chance to apply them today. My name is Chris Pollack. I'm your dealer support specialist hosting these events. My contact information is certainly here for you. I'm an East Coast rep, uh, but I'm always available for anybody as a resource. Uh, my specialty tends to be operation and programming based, but I do get into quite a bit of the technical side as well. So if anybody has any questions regarding Siemens contact, needs a hand, by all means, feel free to reach out to me. Probably best way would be email, but you can always try to give me a call as well. So we got a couple uh, interesting webinars coming up. I always like to uh, show you guys what's uh, coming down the pipeline. Our next one, which is going to be the end of January, once we've all gotten through the holiday season here, we're going to show you the new software version 4.7. Um, so that's going to actually kind of cover two topics. We have introduced a new Sinu train that supports 4.7. So we'll show you some of the features included in that and then use that to show you some of the new functions from an operation and programming standpoint that have been included in uh, version 4.7. So I think you'll be um, pleasantly surprised. We've done a lot of work in some of the drilling cycles, put some advanced features there, with a, a new tool path for high-speed machining called Top Surface. We'll talk about that. Um, and then after that, our next scheduled webinar is going to be March 3rd. And that's one I've been waiting to do for quite a long time. That's going to be what we call flexible NC programming. Uh, a lot of people in the industry might think of it as variable-based programming. So you'll get a chance to see this will all be you know, G-code based, so to speak. But you'll get a chance to see how to create variables, create local variables, global variables, um, start to maybe create your own logic statements. You know, when you get into custom measuring cycles and features like that, you get into a lot of logic type statements. So we're going to go through a webinar based on just kind of the mechanism and how that whole thing works to get you guys started in using some of these advanced features or functions within the controls. That's coming up on the 3rd of March, so hopefully you'll be able to make it. As I've mentioned, though, in the past, um, all the webinars can be viewed. This is our new website you're seeing here. If you haven't had a chance to go to it, please, by all means, take a look at it. Uh, same website it's always been. We've just kind of updated the look. I think you're going to find it's a lot easier to navigate around through it. We've broken up the webinars more based on the specific content. So you see in the, on the right side of the screen, we have milling, turning, general operation, or maintenance and service. So we're going to start to, um, hopefully over the next year, we'll, we'll add more to the maintenance and service side. We've done a lot of operation and programming-based webinars. We'd like to do some more service-based stuff. Um, and then general operation, that certainly has the, the webinars that we talk about when we get into um, sinew train and that kind of functionality. So hopefully you'll find it a lot easier to, to sort through the content. I know we're getting quite a bit of data up there now, quite a bit of webinars there for your use. Additionally, I always like to get a chance to mention our classes that we offer. The classes are out in Elk Grove Village. These are generally three-day workshops. However, uh, I'm hoping maybe we can increase the length of them in maybe in the not-so-distant future, at least for some of the more advanced ones. Um, we do a service-based seminar here to kind of educate you on how to properly support the Cinemark product line covering the 828 and 840 controls. Additionally, we have three operation and programming classes, level one through level three. Level one starts out with conversational shop mill and shop turn. Level two goes into more advanced programming with program guide, and that's kind of what you're going to see a little bit about today. And then level three is a five axis class that I host out there as well. So if you ever get a chance, please feel free to try to come out and join us. Um, the, host, the classes themselves are no charge to you, and there's a lot of great content, a lot of hands-on content you get to experience. So by all means, take a look. But what I did also want to mention today, which is a new initiative that um, we've been putting forth, and we call it the Machine Registration Initiative. See, one of the things that's tough for us at Siemens is to get 
really good understanding or visibility of the machines that are in our market space. Um, specifically, when it comes time to support these machines outside of warranty, you know, maybe we happen to know how many units a specific builder brings in, but if we don't know the components that are in the machine, then when the end user calls and needs to replace a servo motor or another Siemens-based component in the system from, for a service down the road, we have no idea what's in that machine. And that's where the pain point to the customer starts. So what's neat, and this started with Operate, is we have the ability and the control to physically register the machine with us. And while registering, a complete bill of materials gets electronically created and uploaded into our system. So now when you go into where you call our database and we give you give us your machine serial number, we know the motors you have, the drives you have, software versions you have, um, encoder resolutions, everything specific, Siemens specific to that machine is in that file. Um, so to incentivize people to start to see the value in this and take advantage of it, we have this new program. Uh, what's neat with this program is you can get a copy of Sinutrain. You can get a trial version completely free by starting the initial registration process. And then you'll get a voucher once the system gets validated in our system for 70% discount off of the full version of Sinutrain. It's, a, it's quite a great savings. Additionally, I believe there's also a, a um, spare parts voucher. So um, there's definitely some, some great reasons, certainly outside of the service and support side, why you might want to consider registering your machines. Um, if you're not sure if your machine's registered, try it. So go to the main website. Click on the link. When you click on the Learn More, it will drill you through. There's a whole little instruction packet of what it takes to create this file and upload it into our system. Go through the process. Uh, I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. Um, really, we try to give out the vouchers um, whenever, we, whenever we can, absolutely. So it's just a new program. I certainly wanted to get a minute to point out. Okay. So uh, as, as always, or as typical, <laughs> if I can want to say always, um, we are going to be talking specifically today about the 828 and the 840 controls. Uh, we do have an 808 control platform. Uh, you'll find a lot of the stuff we're going to talk about does relate to the 808, but maybe not directly because the interface screens and some of the cycles are a little different. So everything you say to see today can be applied to either the 828 or 840. If you're looking at it from the 808 perspective, you'll have to um, you'll have to kind of understand that there's there will be some slight differences between those two interfaces. So in this case, just giving us an overview of what we're going to look at today, we're going to really concentrate on those standard cycles that we have a tendency to maybe take for granted a lot of times. So we're going to dig into uh, the drilling cycles, all the specific components with the drilling cycles, go through all the milling cycles, how to position, and uh, really get a chance to kind of explore in depth each of these cycles and, and some of the advantages within the cycles. You'll find that we probably go a little bit beyond what our, a lot of our competitors do as far as the number of new configurations of cycles that we have. Okay, sorry about that. I was just uh, responding back to one of our attendees that were trying to, uh, they were having problems with the login. Okay, so what we'll do today is we're going to use this example. Um, intentionally, I created this example just to take, take advantage of a lot of these different standard cycles within the system. So we'll look at doing a face milling operation first. Once we face milled the, the, the shape or the part, we're going to drop in. We're going to do a circular pocket to clear the center bore. We will use our spigot or boss milling cycle to leave this multi-sided boss standing up from the feature. Then we're going to come in and we're going to slot an open slot through the center of the part. From there, you're going to get a chance to see how to thread mill. We're going to talk about thread milling in detail. We're going to put thread mill of a, um, of a two inch thread mill on the ID of this hole. From there, we'll center drill. And we're going to center drill and drill holes at different planes. So the four-hole bolt hole pattern on the outside, you'll notice here, is about a half inch down on the surface. Two-hole bolt pattern is going to be right at the top. 
So you can see how to jump between different planes. We'll leverage a couple different drilling cycles, go through tapping as well. So I think by the end of this, we'll have a real good understanding of these cycles and certainly where you can apply them and, and how to utilize them a little better than maybe you have in the past. So first things first, it would only be natural actually to start with milling, to face mill the part first. So we're gonna go through the milling side. Once we've gone through the milling side, then we're going to switch back and we're going to take a look at drilling. Uh, and then time allowing, I have a little bit of advanced content where we'll talk about some fourth axis functionality as well um, and what's supported and what's not. So first things first, we're going to take a look at the physical milling tab. So had you been in front of your machine or in Cine Train and we started a new program in Program Guide, we would see, just like you see across the top of the screen here, you would see these, these horizontal soft keys that would be on the bottom of the display. And this would be all the different areas where I can kind of explore into when creating a program. So by selecting the milling button, you will get the vertical soft keys to display, just like you see on the left side of the screen. And these are all the cycles that are now available to us from the standard cycle category. So we have our face milling cycle, which we'll be using first. That allows us to do either a unidirectional or a bidirectional toolpath, but designed specifically for facing off apart. We can get into pocketing. And there's certainly different variants of pocketing that we're going to look at today. From there, I can get into the spigot cycle. And spigot will support um, squares, rectangles, circles, and multi-sided. We'll get a chance to use it for multi-sided. Then we're going to look at our slotting cycles. And you'll find we have a, a whole array of different slotting cycles built into the control. Additionally, we're going to look at the thread milling. Thread milling is for thread milling either internal or external thread mills. And we will touch upon the engraving cycle. So our first cycle that we're going to apply to the part program, thinking of that, that little part that we were uh, just showing you there a second ago, would be the face milk cycle. Now, when you enter any cycle, one of the first things you want to pay attention to is the right vertical soft keys, because there are modifiers here to control how the cycle is going to work. So that would be these vertical keys right here, just above the cancel key. By selecting them, I can create barriers or inhibit the actual motion of the physical tool. So let's say I had a stop or um, a fixture, something was in the way, and I couldn't allow, or a feature on the part, I couldn't allow the, the physical cutter to automatically go over it, which it naturally would in a facing routine. These would limit my tool path. Then from there, we're really just going to go through this data mask. So what you're going to find is G-code within the Siemens control isn't just straight G-code. It, it actually is kind of a hybrid of G-code and conversational built into one in program guide with what we call these data masks. So you're going to get to see how they get applied. As we start to use it, you're going to see what the output code is as well. So here's going to be our first little operation or, or little challenge. We're going to start a program inside of the program guide software. Going to set up some basic safety lines. A lot of this stuff that we're going to go through, we'll go through kind of quickly because you've seen it in previous webinars. And then we're going to jump directly into the face milling cycle, explain all the variables, explain some of the different variances that I can do in controlling the cycle. We'll drop it in and we'll get a chance to simulate it and take a look. And we'll kind of go step by step as we go through this routine in building a program. So instead of going through a lot of content and then creating all those features, we're going to kind of break this, this webinar down into pieces. So why don't we do that now? Why don't we segue over into Train and let's try to um, physically build this toolpath portion. So I'm going to jump over to Train and I am using, oops, sorry, I grabbed the wrong one. There's my Train. So this is version 4.5. Um, this is actually the latest version of Cine Train. We, we've just released an edition three that would be available for download if you guys are, are interested in it. Um, it's going to be extremely similar to the previous release version of edition two. Um, when you see the later 4.7, you'll kind of start to see some of the advantages of this edition three. Um, outside of that, I wouldn't necessarily go rushing to upgrade to it. I don't think there's going to be a lot of features um, until you start to see 4.7. Then you'll, you'll kind of see where this goes. So, so what we're going to do is we're going to start writing a part program, just like we said. Our physical, physical part, let's bring up the sample so you guys can kind of keep that in the corner, so you can kind of keep that in reference. And we're going to face off this basic part. 
So as always, we're going to go over to Program Manager. We're going to pick an area in our memory where we're going to start writing programs. I'm going to write it in the Part Program section. We're going to select a new program. And we're going to make sure that we're on the Program Guide G Code option. Now, any of us that have seen this similar webinar in Conversational, you would have noticed we did everything through Shop Mills. So now we're going to do it in G Code, and you'll be able to compare a lot of the similarities and differences between the two programming environments. So give it a name. Um, as we stated in the past, names are allowed to be letters, numbers, and underscores, no other special characters. The system will automatically give us our extension, which is a .mpf standing for main program file. So I'm going to call this, uh, I don't know, call it example underscore one. Um, capitals don't matter. You can have lowercase or capitals up to you. Select OK. Program's going to start. And away I go. So that first line, if you remember from that quick slide I showed you, that's our safety line. So this is very standard kind of stuff. I'm going to tell the machine I'm in, I'm in absolute mode. I'm in inch mode, which work coordinate I'm using, and potentially how my tool is oriented. So I'm going to be in a G17 plane. Now, we do need to get the blank, which we've done in the past when looking at program guide programs. So my blank for graphical purpose is found under various, and it's going to be in the upper right-hand corner. That's my blank. And this is going to allow me to now set up the simulation. So. If you happen to have a machine, either an older machine or a machine that wasn't commissioned for rotary axes, then you probably wouldn't have seen this clamping field. However, if your machine is equipped with rotary axes, whether it's just a simple four axis like we have here today, or a five axis machine, then I can denote not only where is my part oriented in space, but whether I'm doing three axis toolpath or four or five axis toolpath. So this gets important when we go to more advanced technology. If you have it and you're running the machine as a simple three-axis mill, you just want to make sure you leave it on table. In this case, I certainly have my cylinders and my pipes, my normal primitives that I would say for my graphics. I'm going to use a basic block centered. Block center is going to establish the zero at the middle. Then we have a length and a width to determine the overall, the overall size of the block. How much material I want to be leaving, in this case, in the plus on Z. So I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to assume in this scenario that I want to leave the top of the part as Z0 once it's been faced off. Anything down into the part is going to be negative. Anything plus is going to be moving in the other direction. So I'm going to give it negative one inch. So if I look at the print, I see it's one inch thick, so that will work. Now I'm assuming that I'm not going to machine the final uh, five by five square peripheral. We'll say that that was already machined in a previous op or the, you know, the rough size coming out of the shear or the saw is adequate enough. So we're just going to work on the rest of this. So the jaws could be up against that scenario. Let's accept the event. And like any of the cycles as we go through, you're going to see that they build this cycle string. So when I'm doing it here using the interface, I can just draw, drive everything from the physical conversational cycle. So, so any of the cycles we go into, you're going to see it in a second when we go to face mill, it's going to build the cycle mask, right? and it's going to build this cycle string. The cycle string is just a comma delimited string. So if you want to do any editing on it, it's as simple as being on the cycle and either clicking this arrow button with your mouse or physically at the machine tool, you're usually navigating with your green buttons on the right side. So you click the green arrow open and open it up. Okay, so we have our workpiece. I'm going to go grab a tool. So we're going to go select under edit our face mill to save time because we have a lot of material. I've pre-created our tools. And again, I'm jumping over a lot of this basic stuff that has been covered in previous sessions. Um, by all means, go back and take a look at some of the earlier webinars if you want to get some more detail into this, the basic mechanisms of G-code programming. Okay, so I fire up my spindle, I get the tool in, and now we're going to go into the milling cycle. Now, Understand whenever you go through any cycles, it always inserts it below the cursor. So you'll notice, you know, had I left my cursor down and I go into a cycle, I'll end up with spaces. And, and that's okay, but if you don't like the spaces, if you're a little on the anal side like myself, um, then leave the cursor on the line that you were just pre previously on. So now when I go into a given cycle and I save the cycle, for argument's sake, I won't get a space or a blank. So for our case, we go to mill. We go to face mill. I'm going to open up the cycle. And this would be the face milling cycle. 
So earlier I mentioned keep an eye on the right side. Well, this is how I can adjust my toolpath. So what is the face mill going to do? Well, it's going to give me a bidirectional or a unidirectional toolpath, and that can be oriented either in X or in Y using this direction field. But these limiters will then say, hey, I don't want to go beyond it. So if I was to watch this, the tool will come down and make sure it overlaps, like you see in the graphics here, on all four sides of the shape. It's a facing routine That's, that would be normally desired. However, again, we have a stop here. I can put a limiter, and you see it pushes it down. Now, the system's smart enough to realize, hey, if you tell it to limit it on a side that I'm stepping over, you could get additional material. So it's warning you that, well, maybe an X and Y toolpath isn't the best strategy for this scenario. Maybe I have to change it to a Y scenario as opposed to an X cut scenario. So that's where you'll first set up your conditions based on the facing cycle. Then from there, you're just going to fill out the page from top to bottom. So the first thing we ask you is the tool plane, and you'll see that this is common in any of the CAN cycles. Now, I've already set the system up in G17. It was part of my safety line. So I don't need to keep repeating this if I don't want to. I can just leave it blank, and then the blank field would then obviously modal use whatever orientation. Now, had I been switching to a red angle head or on a machine that maybe on a lathe where I have, you know, peripheral tools and axial tools, then I can bounce between my orientations because most controls think of G17, 18, 19 for arc interpolation. We in the Siemens control allow us to physically control the direction our tool is pointing in. This is our tool plane. So all of our CAN cycles will transpose based on the variant I give it. Now from there, we're asked to do a retract strategy, a retract plane. So that's really comes into where do I want to go when I'm done with a given cycle. So here, I happen to have a half inch, you know, maybe I want to go up a little higher to retract. A lot of that will depend on what comes next. You know, if I know I'm going to be using that tool for something else, I might want to keep it a lot closer to my surface. This is an absolute value. So positive or negative, depending on where I'm at, I do have to pay attention to that. Now, the safety distance is an incremental value, so it's always unsigned. And that's going to be how close I'm going to allow the machine to wrap it before I start to feed. So this is going to be driven eventually off of what we put in here for the Z0 field. Feed rate, we can give it a, a feed rate that I want to machine this, this tool path on. Now, feed rate, in this case, was something that I previously set it up. Some of these fields you're going to find are required. So if you're not sure where you need to fill in data, just try leaving it blank. If you lose the accept key, if it gives you a description of there's something wrong, if the field is red, well, then we're definitely telling you we need to know that information. So in this case, I need to tell it my feed rate. Now we give it a machining strategy. So whenever we see a single diamond, that would be a roughing scenario, or a triple diamond would be a finishing scenario. The big thing facing would be whether I want to allow the system to take multiple cuts in Z or not. Certainly, if I was finishing, I would expect it to just go right down to the bottom of the deck take a cut all the way across, and be done. Pick your strategy like we talked about before. This would be your cut direction strategy. And now fill out the page. Now, for those of us that are used to shop mill and are just getting used to using these cycles in program guide or G-code, we're used to this screen being driven by the block form that we set up in the header page. But if you notice, there is no header page in G-Code. It doesn't exist. That's why I had to do the work piece blank. That's why I had to do the safety line and everything else manually. So all this stuff just got retained from the last time I filled the page out. It's not being driven by that block. So you will have to make sure you fill this out each time you come in. So in this case, I'm using, I'm defining the lower left-hand corner as the starting position. Don't let the X0, Y0, Z0 confuse you. Some people think that this means the physical zero on the part. It's nothing to do with that. It's just a starting location, and then X1, Y1, Z1 would be an ending location. So for this scenario, it's asking me to describe two opposing corners so we know what the box is, what the rectangle is. So I can use the lower left, upper right, upper left, it doesn't matter. You know, I could have told it, you know, I want to start at positive 2.5 here and a negative 2.5, right? So that would be the lower right corner. Well, if I'm using the lower right corner, I better use the upper left corner of the other side 
So this now would become a negative 2.5. So it's not physical part zero, just where do I want to start, where do I want to end. My Z field, this would be my rough stock. So I do want to tell it I had 30 thou on the part. From there, I fill up my Z1, which is where do I want to end. So if I started 30 thou up, I'm going to end at, in this case, zero. My, depth, my step over, my radial engagement, here we got 50%. Now, if you want to change this, if you watch, when I move down the cursor, you'll see that you can get a, you can get a horseshoe up, or you'll see that the, the, the right is highlighted. That just means that when I hit the select key, it's going to toggle between two different values. There we get the little help bubble popped up with the little horseshoe. The horseshoe referring to this little select key. So if you wanted to find a physical distance, set it to incremental. If you wanted to find the percentage of a cutter diameter, set it to percent. And then the final will be how much material I'm leaving for a finished cut. So we select accept. Cycle gets inserted. Now I'm going to give it a quick little M30, and we can simulate it and start to see we're getting some tool path. So that is sufficient enough to actually have been a part program. Uh, so the basic safety line, changing the tool, and then certainly the cycle 61. Now the machine is now sitting one inch above. I haven't told it to do anything else. So it returned to that retraction position that I set up before inside the cycle. It's waiting for its next operation. If we needed to make a change, maybe I want to change the cut direction. Right now, if you look, it's actually physically machining while moving up in a Y direction. So now you can go back into the given cycle, change our cut direction, accept it, and it'll drive it from there. So typically, you're not ever expected to edit inside of this common delimited mask. In fact, you'll notice, see I have a cursor here when I'm up in these upper areas, but when I go onto the cycle, the cycle, if you can see it on your display, has a little bit of a blue hue. And when I move my cursor down, you get no cursor. So we lock you out of being able to edit in the given cycle. We're expecting you to physically drive it from this data mask. The masks are always there for you to utilize. Now, if I wanted to do some kind of a modification, there is a trick that I can use to be able to get a cursor onto a given line. And that is the shift and insert command. And this works at the machine as well as in Train on your PC. So you notice we get a cursor. So, so why would I want to make a change here? Um, probably the most common scenario would be, hey, you know what, I don't want to do this line or I want to do a, um, a, an optional block skip. Let's say a block skip would be a forward slash I can add forward slashes at the cycle level. This way, if I use the op optional block command, it'll jump over it. Same scenario, sometimes when I am um, debugging a program, uh, maybe I put an operation in there that I don't need, I want to jump over, um, and I don't want to use the block skip function. I can also put a semicolon. Semicolons are comments, so anything to the right of a semicolon is now negated. So you'll notice, not only do I have the semicolon, but if you can tell, the cycle is no longer blue. It's now white. Uh, it's white because it's no longer recognized as a physical cycle anymore until I go back and change the semicolon. So be careful what you put in, especially if you're programming these longhand, uh, whether you were in an you know, outside editor or maybe more likely you're using some kind of a cam system to drive these. You want to be very careful with the syntax. Generally what I do when I'm debugging um, output code, first I look to see if the system recognizes it's a cycle in the first place. Is it blue? If it's blue and it allows me to open with the mask, then I'll come in and start to validate if all of the variables appear correct. Okay, so we're going to now jump back over to our PowerPoint here and continue on moving some extra, adding some extra tool paths. So the next cycle set we wanted to explore are our pocket cycles. So the pockets within the Siemens control allow us to handle both rectangular and circular pockets. So, so it's a, a basic primitive type of shape. Um, but you'll find as we dig through the cycles, there are a lot of capabilities even built into a simple rectangular circular pocket. So we're going to explore a lot of these different variables. Now I popped up all of the help screens here. So 
as you're going through, certainly we're not going to be able to go through every single variable in, in, in detail within the hour and a half we have allotted for this webinar. But what you want to do when you're on a control or when you're inside a your training is get used to where the help button is. Because any physical cycle I'm in, if I hit the help button, it's going to bring up this breakdown. And what you'll find is when you go into the series of cycles, we've tried to keep the variables as common as we can. So, you know, the, the X or Y or Z variable, that's going to have the same meaning no matter what cycle you're in. Um, so whether I'm just jumping between a rectangular, circular pocket, or I'm going to a face mill as opposed to a pocket, if it's a common variable, you know, whenever you see a UZ, that's finish amount in Z. Anytime there's a U on the line, it's going to represent a finish amount. Um, but if you look in the help screen, it'll steer you in the right direction. It'll start to allow you to understand that. So here we have UXY, finish allowance in plane, pocket edge uh, for chamfering. Okay, so in our case, on our part, we need to drop back in and we need to machine out that circular center circular hole. Uh, the center circular hole will eventually become a thread milling routine. So this is what the next tool path is going to look like. We do have to handle the tool change, give it some speeds and feeds, and then we can jump right into the pocketing event. So back over to sinew train. I'm going to bring my cursor down just by hitting my input button on the yellow button or enter key on your keyboard. Let's go grab a tool. I'm going to use the three-quarter inch ML to do a lot of this tool path. Just save us some tool changes so we can really dig into the physical cycles because that's the important part here. I'm just going to give it some basic speeds and feeds. Um, luckily enough, I happen to have the ability of just virtually machining, so it's a little more forgiving than you guys that actually have to really cut this stuff. Okay, so let's go into milling and jump over to pocket. So below face, you'll find the pocket cycle. Now, just like a face milling, you know, I said pay attention to the right right side of the column. Well, here you're actually changing which cycle you're going to use. So I'm going to either drill into rectangular or into circular pocket. So rectangular allows me to physically set up not only a starting orientation for the pocket, but what the width and the length of the pocket would be. Circular, which we're going to do now, allows me to do the same thing, but now it's obviously going to just be a round hole. So I don't need a length and a width. I'll just give it a starting position and ending position. So let's start to fill out the page and build up this cycle. So if we look at the example real quick, we are eventually going to put a two inch eight thread on the inside of this hole. So we want a through hole of a 1.9 diameter. So that's what we're going to machine. So plane we had before, that's the PL field, same definition applies. So I could leave it blank or I could define it as a G17. Now this is new. Um, you haven't seen this yet, down cut or up cut. This is controlling conventional milling or climb milling. If you forget which is which, just click the option. So in this case, down cut is going to be climb milling. And up cut's going to be conventional milling. We see even the graphic updates. So this is the exact same field that you're used to filling out when you did it in the uh, header page in shop mill. We have our retract plane. Where do I go when I'm done with the cycle? So in this case, I'm probably going to use this tool for a little bit more. I might not want to be jumping all the way up to an inch. So I'll just jump up 100 thou. I'm going to get within 50 thou like we did before of a given surface, which is driven by Z0. We give it some feed rate. And now we to decide what we want to do as far as machining. Are we roughing? Are we finishing? Now this finish would finish the floor and the wall. If I pick just a finish on the wall, it would strictly finish the wall as it states. But we also give you chamfering functions in a lot of these cycles. So, so pay attention to this. And the chamfering is pretty powerful. Um, it's going to use the defined tools so as long as the tool is built properly with an angle. And you simply just tell it the chamfer size and the insertion depth and it calculates where it needs to send the tool to achieve that size chamfer. In our case, we're going to just rough it out. Now, when you get to circular, we have our traditional plane by plane, which is most, what are, most of us are used to, but we can also do a helical tool path as well. And I can do a single position, or we can actually control this like a drilling cycle. So later, we'll talk about this position pattern M call. Well, just keep that in the back of your head. Wherever I, however we apply it in drilling, I can do the same thing in milling. We're going to do a simple single position. Now, in this case, I'm going to just set, sorry, the center zero zero, top of the part zero. 
we have a through hole diameter or ending diameter of 1.9. Now I gave it a little bit more than the one inch because I know I want to break through the hole. We're going to step over. Now this is going to do a helical tool path all the way down, but it's not going to obviously have enough cutter diameter to cut an entire 1.9 inch pocket. So that's where my step over comes in. She'll do a helical path, pull out, move over, in this case 50% of my cutter diameter, and then continue that tool path as it goes. But what it does need to know is how aggressive I want this ramp in to be. So that is my P variable or my pitch variable. So in this case, I'm going to advance 100 thou for every 360 degree helix that I do until I get all the way down to the 1.5. We said it earlier, whenever I have a U, it's finished. So had I wanted to come back to do a finished cut, I could. Just keep in mind, everything's driven by this little technology field, this machining field. So if I have a, a single diamond plus a triple diamond, that means I'll rough and finish on the same cycle. And you will see that in some of the cycles. In this case, since I don't have a combination, Whatever I leave here for finish when I'm roughing is going to be left there for me to come in with a new cycle and take it out. And then, and finally, we do have the option of remachining. So had I drilled a hole in this part and I didn't want to waste time machining where the hole was, I could fill out the parameters of this given hole, the depth and the size, and the machine would, would optimize its tool path. Fill out the cycle, save it. We get our cycle that comes in. We go back over to simulate, and now you'll see we get our pocketing cycle in. Okay, so we're starting to move along. We cleared out our pocket. Now let's continue on with our PowerPoint here. I'll just minimize that. And we're going to now leave a boss frame. So when we get to the spigot cycle, and think of spigot um, like a boss because that's what you're doing. You're leaving a standing feature, so you're working on the outside. So spigots allow us to handle three different basic shapes or primitive shapes. Rectangles, circles, or multi-sided. Now what you'll find with the multi-sided, which is what we're gonna use, is you can actually adapt this to be used for circles or squares. It won't handle a rectangle, but it will handle a square. Why I would even entertain doing that is the rectangle and the circle toolpath was decided, designed not to clear all the material up to the boss, but just to work around this, this physical boss. So I can do a lead in and a lead out approach, but I can't step up to it. You would need to use the spigot cycle under contour milling if you needed to clear up to this regular shape. However, the multi-sided actually did. So what the difference is, if you can see it on the, the graph, you can see in the multi-sided I get a DXY field DXY doesn't exist in either of the cycles. DXY, just like we saw a little bit with the pocket, that's my step over, that's my radial engagement field. So if it's not there, then I can't step up to it. This one allows me to. So in our case, we're going to use the DXY. We're gonna use a multi-sided cycle. We're gonna put it in as a cycle 79, and it's gonna allow us to machine and leave this multi-sided boss standing for us. So we're going to continue on in our program. Now, I'm using the same tool for this feature. I can leave the highlight on the previous pocket because, remember, it always inserts below. So now we can jump into our spigot. And here are our three features or spigots. So rectangular and circular. Again, there's no DXY. It always throws guys off because there's the W1 and the L1, the starting position and then your finished position, W and L. So we would think, well, if there's a significant distance between the two, why wouldn't it clear up? It's using the W1 and the L1 to control just simply the lead in and lead out. So it makes sure the machine is always ramping it out off of the part. That's why we ask for them, but it's not gonna let you clear up. That's where the DXY comes into. That's where this is gonna come in handy. So we start filling out the page and you're gonna start to see a common thread here. You know, the same variables we just explained, the tool plane, what our, what our convention, milling convention is. Where do I want to go when I'm done? Maybe I'll just go 100,000 above it. How close do I want to get when I start feeding? What's my feed rate? Am I roughing? Um, how many positions am I going to do? Is it a pattern or is it not? These, the definitions are all the same. What's the origin? So in this case, where's the center of the feature? It's going to be zero, zero, zero. 
Now this is new, and this would be where am I starting from? You know, so what is the the diameter? Now if I brought up the print here, you're going to notice that. Uh, let me bring up the print, the right one. We don't truly dimension. Now I know that the overall part is five inches. You know, I could so I take a little bit of an educated guess. You know, maybe I'll leave it something a little smaller, and we'll see what happens first. So there, I'll leave it at five. I do have to tell it the number of sides I have. So in this case, there's six. And I have a couple options here. I can tell it the physical length of one given side, or if I select the select key, I can give it the overall width. So that's just really driven what I've been given dimensionally on my part print. So if I happen to know just the side length, which I do, that's what I'm going to give it. I can control its orientation. So I want it to be at zero. So my physical right side is vertical, but maybe it's at some angle, and I can put the angle it's going to clock it at. I can define a corner radius. So the print told me I have a 250 radius, so I'll define it. Just like earlier, I define where do I start, and then where do I end in Z. So I have this set as absolute, so I'm going to end a half an inch deep. I'm using a step over, just like I did with the pocket. In this case, I'm going to use 50% of the cutter diameter. So also could be changed to a linear distance or an incremental distance by hitting the select key. I have my depth per pass, so I'm going to take a couple passes here. And then do I want to leave a finished cut? So if I fill out the page, I hit accept, it inserts the cycle for us. We jump over to simulate, and we can start to see what the toolpath is going to start to look like. So we face off, pocket, and then we're going to come in. Now, in this case, you notice I didn't quite have enough to fully clean up. I'm leaving some material in the corners. So that would be why I had a 6-inch value there initially as opposed to the 5. So it's a simple, let's just jumping back. We'll do a quick editing change. Accept. Now, you will notice that simulation always starts from the beginning. Um, there are some tricks. You could use some jump statements or go-tos to move around. Um, but you can also just do a Control-M, and that will move the speed of which it simulates to what we call max, or 120%. So I use that trick a lot, especially in CineTrain. I'll just do Control-M again, toggles it back to whatever I was previously at. So had I had it cranked way down, because I wanted to really get a good understanding of the tool, so here I can see the tool comes in, I jump it up, I jump it back, and it's going to put me right back to the original percentage I was at. So we were using 100%. Okay, so you see we got the boss feature standing up. I can maybe take my path off, and we'll zoom in a little bit. You can start to see we're starting to get the feature built. So I said I could use this as a round or a square, well, that would be simply defining I have four-sided as opposed to six. And then if I make the corner radius large enough that all the corners become tangent, it now becomes a circle. So you could use this multi-sided in a couple different ways if you need to use it as a way to clear up to the part. The other, the other trick or the other thing that people will do um, when they want to use the spigot cycles and they don't want to go to the contour milling is I can just tell it I got extra material here and just chain a couple in a row and let that kind of work up to my given part. Okay, so from here, we've gotten our boss on. We've started to see some of the cycles. Now we're gonna see the slotting cycle. And slotting gives us a few different options or variations of a, of a given slot. But this is really designed for a traditional, like a keyway slot or an encapsulated slot, something, something to that effect. So the slotting cycle can have a, an encap, a captured slot here, like you see in the longitudinal slot. It can have what we call circumferential slots, so slots that are, are wrapped around a radius, so they're actually curved slots. We can do open slots, and an open slot we have, we have strategies like trichoidal milling to mill out the slot. But we also have a new slot, or shall I say new because it's not supported in shop mill, which is called an elongated slot. Now, all the slots up till, up till before elongated, all these slots had one common theme. The physical tool is going to clear out a slot that's wider than its tool. Now, 
the slotting cycle isn't a pocketing cycle, so it's not going to handle um, this giant slot with a very, very tiny tool. In fact, the toolpath has to basically touch or overlap. Um, so you can never have a slot that's greater than, or well, that half the width of the slot is greater than the physical diameter of the tool. Once you exceed that, and there would be material left in the middle, you'd really have to use a rectangle um, to be able to rectangle a pocket um, to be able to handle that. Now, when you get to the elongated hole, this isn't going to do any step over. So when you get those cases where I want to create a slot that's the width of my tool and I want to be able to, you know, maybe take multiple cuts in my Z and feedback X and Y, you can use the elongated hole. But this cycle is only available inside of Program Guide. Um, if you'll notice in Shop Mill, it's just not up there. Why? I don't know. I guess it's one of those things that we haven't, haven't added to Shop Mill at this point probably coming down the road. So here, just to give you an example of the physical cycle, if I go into milling and slot and select elongated, we're going to get a similar type of feature, but nowhere in here are we going to get the DXY field. We'll get a multiple depth, we'll get maybe a feed in Z, but we're not going to get the... So whether I was to trichloroidal mill or to slot mill, I'm going to slot mill in this example, I can kind of do the same type of tool path. But again, the limiter here is that my slot has to be the width of my physical tool. So if we go to sinew train. Now I have a three quarter inch tool. And if we looked at the part print, and it's going to be hard for you guys to see, but the slot itself, you're going to have to trust me here, is uh, three quarters of an inch wide. So here I can just drop in and clear a slot right through this part. So we go into the slotting cycle, and here you start to see all those slots we were talking about. So longitudinal slot will allow us to step over. Let's see if I can give you a good graphic of that. I'm sure there's one here. There's your depth for pass. There's your material. Um, but I do have to pay attention to my tool width in relation to my overall width of my slot. Circumferential is these arc slots. Now, you don't have to do multiple slots. So if I had just one, I can change this to a one field. So I can put it to one. Don't, a lot of guys will think that these help screens are dynamic. They're not, they're just static screens. So because I set it to one, I still see four slots. It doesn't mean I'm gonna get four. Uh, remember, this is just a, a help screen. In fact, if you pick graphic view, that'll actually start to show you what the result would look like. This is pretty handy um, if you want to get an actual representation of what you're about to do. So for our case, we're going to come down to elongated. And yes, my, here's my open slot. So open slot is where I have my trichoidal milling strategies. I can do plunge milling. We can do a scalloped cut if you want, up cut, down cut, and scalloped. But the elongated, this is the case that's going to allow me to create that slot just with the tool width. So we can define the plane, retract, safety, all this is the same as we've been doing up till now, feed rate. So we can do what's called centric or oscillation. So it's kind of neat. So really it's going to be, do I want to plunge to my first step, feed across plunge, or do I want to ramp in and across the whole way down? I'm just going to do a simple centric. To note where I want X, Y, Z be referenced from. So in this case, my slot's going to be center of my part. Um, but had I dimensionally known it from some other point, I could change that around. Tell it how many I want. We're going to do a single position. Give it my physical location. An overall length of the slot. If the slot is angled, mine is not, so I'm going to leave it at zero. How deep the slot is. How much do I want to take per pass? And how do I want to feed in in Z? So I might not want to feed at 100 inches per minute. So here we'll reduce the feed to 20 inches a minute. Accept it. We get our longitudinal slot. And now we're going to start to see the parts going to start looking very similar to what we are trying to achieve. So we have our pockets. And we walk around the outside. And I just sped it up a little bit for time's sake. And there we get our slot through the center. So if we put on our path, there's actually two straight moves machining out this part, this physical slot. And again, the slot itself 
if you notice, is around here, is equal to the width of the physical end mill. Okay. So I know we're kind of burning through this material, but there's a lot more to do. And I know we're short on time. Okay. Now, what I do want to do to, to wrap up the milling segment is talk about the thread milling cycle and the engraving cycle. Um, now, first, the thread milling cycle, this will be handled internal or external, left hand or right hand, all done, sport in the cycle. Um, one of the things this cycle doesn't do, which a lot of customers do ask for from time to time, is if I want to thread mill tapered threads. Now, it's not that you can't thread mill a tapered thread, but this cycle is really designed for a multi-fluted or multi-tooth thread mill. So in that case, the thread mill will actually have the angle of the tapered thread ground into it. Had you wanted to do that singular tooth spiral that starts to bring the tool in or out to generate the full thread mill, um, you'd have to use um, like our helix commands, um, some different cycles. You're not going to use the thread mill cycle for that. This is designed for tools that are ground to have the physical angle into them. Now, additionally, the one thing that tends to throw guys off when, um, when trying to use the thread mill cycle itself is you'll run it and you'll find that the feed rate is going to be higher or lower than what you programmed. And a lot of guys think that there's a bug, or there's a problem in the system. Well, there, there's not. In fact, what happens is when you're given a feed rate based on a tool geometry and a material, that feed rate that's given to you is a linear feed rate. So it's assuming you're moving in a straight line. Well, in a thread mill, you're not moving in a straight line. You're always doing a circle. So what, what you want is you want to have the feed rate at the edge of the tool. Well, because of that, you have to calculate the feed rate that was given to you, and you actually use this formula right here. This was given, I, I took this directly out of a thread mill manufacturer's handbook. And this is the formula that you would use to calculate what the true feed would be based on the physical cutter size. So you know that you're achieving the right feed at the edge of the physical thread. So that's what's going on here. So don't let that throw you off. Uh, if you want, you can, if you don't, Trust me, you can plug it into the formula and you'll see that it'll spit out the exact feed. So what we're doing is we're maintaining the feed rate at the tool edge. We're calculating that for you, knowing that you're typically always given that feed rate at the center of the cutter. So if I was on an inside or an outside path, my feed rates would be certainly different. I would have to slow down if I'm inside. I would have to go faster if I was on the outside because the physical path of the tool would be greater. Now, we're going to get back to thread milling in a second, but I did want to talk briefly about the engraving cycle. For any of us that have used it conversationally, it's going to really be pretty much identical. Um, what you'll notice in any of the cycles, there are a few things that aren't there that you're used to conversationally or in shop mill. Uh, the tool field, a um, couple other basic functions here. Um, and that, again, is because in conversational, you're expected to do the tool changes at the cycle level. In G-code, you're doing them externally the cycle. That's why they're not there. Other than that, all the variable supports all the same. Um, it's straight engraving, engraving around an arc. Probably one of the most powerful things within our engraving, and you guys can start to play with it, is when you get to the uh, actual engraved text, you can do variable engraving. So here I can do engraving based on serial numbers, date and time stamps, whatnot. But what we're going to do next is we're going to plug in that thread mill routine. So here we're going to do a quick tool change, and then we're going to actually utilize our cycle 70 command to physically engrave the, or thread mill this feature. So back over to Sinew Train. Let's, uh, let's do a quick tool change. Again, I have all the tools pre-created for you. Now, the one thing with the, the thread mill, thread mills are pretty basic because you're going to do a lot more of the tool diameter handled in the cycle. So we're going to see that here in one second. So let's throw in the tool, do a quick M6, fire up my spindle, some RPM, give it some feed, uh, whichever, and let's jump into the cycle. Now, jump over to milling, jump over to thread mill. We're going to fill out the page. So the first top section is the same as you've been used to, what you've been seeing so far, G17, retract when I'm done, safety distance, 
feed, right? And remember, it is going to do math. So if you run it, it's going to be running a slightly different feed than you have right here because this is the linear feed. Here I can pick if I want to rough or if I want to finish. And now I got some, some new variables to define in Threadmill. I define the direction of toolpath. So it's going to handle a right-hand thread or a left-hand thread for me here. But the bigger thing is, do I want the cutter to work from the top down or the bottom up? So it doesn't really matter. It can, it can handle that path either way in conjunction with the right hand or left hand. So it gives you both strategies. Additionally, I can tell it whether it's an outside thread or an inside thread right here. And now this is where I start to see some of the tool detail at the cycle level. So this is the number of teeth on the thread mill tool. So we're about to cut an eight pitch thread. If I was to look back at the physical schematic, it would say it's a two inch eight thread. So when you get your thread mill tool, you're gonna have a number of physical teeth on it. Now this isn't number of flutes, but number of teeth. So if you think about it, if I have four teeth and I do one helix of this thread mill, I actually just milled four threads in one shot. So our system will automatically calculate that for you. I can do single position or position call. So if I have multiple locations, I can handle that the same way as I would drilling. Tell it where my center is. Now, I've told it the top of the part. I'm going to tell it the bottom. I'm going to make sure I break through a little bit. We can use a table like you would see in tapping, or I can just fill out either the thread pitch. I can fill out a, a, a variable for whether it's a module thread, what the pitch would be in millimeters, or the pitch would be in inch. I'm just toggling through these fields with the select key. I'm using the select key on my keyboard. Now, if I'm doing pitch in threads per inch, just make sure you cancel out the fraction if you don't need it. So that's why I did an eight with zero over 100. Now, the, the diameter, this would be my ending diameter. So in my case, since it's internal, I cleared the hole out to 1.9, and I'm going to machine it out to 2. So with that being said, I happen to already know that I have a thread height of 50 thou. So that's per side, right? Because diametrically, I have a difference of 100 thou between the two. We have our radial engagement. So I'm going to give it 20 thou. If I want to leave material for a finished pass, and then how do I want to clock the thread so I can control where the starting lead in is on the thread? So in this case, I'm not too concerned. I'm going to leave it at zero. So what will happen now as we run this threading cycle, you're going to see we get a bunch of little mini helixes. Now, one thing that's handy as it's simulating is the delete toolpath field because you'll find things get a little muddy, but I don't want to shut my toolpath off because I want to keep getting my toolpath to be shown. So whenever you hit delete toolpath, it's just going to clear whatever happened just prior to it. So we come in, there's our slot. So here is our physical thread mill. So I'm going to zoom in this because this is important for you guys to see. So if you look, we have this one little helix path. So that's going to be the pitch. So an eight pitch thread or eight threads per inch would be a 125 pitch. So the machine physically did a helix dropping an eighth of an inch. And it knew, based on multiple teeth, now this is a static representation. So it's really using four. That was the number that was in the cycle. So it said, OK, well, I can handle four threads. And then it dropped down and said, OK, do another four. And then it dropped down again, because if I only have four teeth, I certainly don't have enough to get an inch, a little over an inch worth of thread. It was an inch 150 is what we gave it. So that's why you get those three routines. And then I got a couple passes in, because I told it to take a depth of cut of 20 thou. I took 20, and it took 40, and came back for one additional 10, machining out my physical profile. OK. so. We are, for all intents and purposes, done with our milling segment. So now I'd like to switch over and talk about drilling. And now we can talk about uh, position pattern, different features, and such like that. So if we jump back into our PowerPoint, the next thing we're going to utilize is the drilling cycles. And you're going to find that there's a whole host of drilling cycles, just like you saw from the milling variant. So we have functions like center drilling. So that would be intended to be a feed to depth and wrap it out, but intending you to use it for spot drilling type of scenarios. We have a drill reaming cycle. Drill reaming is going to feed to depth and then wrap it out, or feed in and feed out, depending if I'm drilling or reaming. 
We will be using that in some holes. Then we have deep hole. So the deep hole you see right here, that's our peck drilling or our chip breaking routine. Um, and there's all kinds of different variants. And you're going to find, as we get to the 4.7 coming up in the next webinar, there were a lot of new features added in the drilling section, especially in this deep hole drilling section. So we will get a chance to talk about that. We won't get a chance to use Use the boring cycle, but if you have a boring head, the boring cycle is designed to work with boring heads. What's nice with the cycle is you can clock and orient the boring tool um, at the bottom of the hole if you want. You can have it pull off the wall and retract out so you don't drag the boring bar up along the wall. So take a look at the boring cycle when you get time. Uh, we will time allow, peck some holes or tap some holes here, so we're going to go into that. And then we're going to position a couple different ways. I'm going to show you as we build up these, this, this six-hole pattern. I'm going to use the position screens that are native. I'll also do it longhand, uh, just giving it some simple rapid commands. And I'm going to show you how to use the position repeat command if I happen to be using my position screen. So first things first, we're going to use the center drill. And I like to use the center drill a lot for one specific reason. One of the two options for controlling the depth of the tool is actually diameter. So what I can do is I can tell it the diameter of the spot face I need to open to. So, you know, if I'm going to drill a quarter inch hole and I know I want a nice little corner break, instead of guessing on the depth, I can say, hey, give me a 300 thou face. And now I know I got a 25 thou chamfer on either side of it. And the system will do the math for you. Uh, it's doing it based on knowing the tool geometry, knowing what the shape of the tool is. So here we're going to do that. Now, how do I give it these positions? Well, there's a couple different ways to tell it how to drill. I can use the position screen, or I can give it um, random locations just by giving it rapids. And a lot of this will depend on how the part program has been created. You know, if I'm doing things longhand at the control, um, it's probably pretty natural to come to the position screen once I understand its functionality and use that for um, giving it the locations. However, if we're driving this from CAD CAM, it's probably not expected to see a CAD CAM system outputting the position screens. They could, but I don't think you're going to on average. So there you're going to see the rapid. So I'm going to show you both ways. So in this first example, we're going to center drill six holes, but six holes being on two different planes, right? So I have my top two holes here, and then I have four holes around the perimeter. So I'm going to show it to you two different ways. We're going to come in, and we're just going to do it longhand using our cycle 81, which is our center drilling cycle, and give it a couple rapid moves. And additionally, I'm going to use the position screen. The position screen is going to allow me to handle the four outside holes. Um, and we will do it at a different plane. Now, this is probably where things differ a little bit uh, than we're used to in shop mill. Um, shop mill, we're, we're used to defining the starting location for the Z depth inside the position screen. And G-code at the cycle level. So if I need to jump a cycle between different planes, different starting planes, then I will have to create a new cycle. So in this case, I will have two separate cycles, cycle 81, one that's going to start drilling from zero, the top of my part. The other one is going to start drilling a half inch down because this back surface, this bottom surface, is a half inch into my part. So let's, let's place those in. So we're ready to go load a new tool. Now you notice I'm not paying a lot of attention to safety shutdown and retracts before tool changes and whatnot. Um, certainly, if I was really writing this program to, um, to methodize on a real machine tool, I would pay a lot more attention to my safety retracts and whatnot. OK, so I got a quick tool change in. Let's fire up my spindle, give it some feed rate for now. Maybe we'll do five inches a minute, and now we want to jump into our drilling. So when you select the drilling button, you get all of the drilling options. So we have five technology cycles up here, from center drilling right through threading or tapping, and then we have the ability of telling it the locations if we want to use the position screens. So in my case, I'm going to center drill, and then we're going to fill out the drilling cycle. Okay, so the G17 definition stays the same, retract stays the same, safety stays the same. So now you're starting to see the consistency from cycle to cycle. However, we're now going to talk about this single position or position pattern that we've been seeing as we go. If I leave the system on single position, what she's going to do is just drill a hole wherever it's physically sitting at. Now, if I need to drill multiple holes, I need to select position pattern. 
Now in this case, I don't have an X0, Y0, Z0 come and go like I do in the pocketing cycles. So you will have to pre-position the drill prior to using the single position, and then it's just gonna drill the hole wherever she's sitting. If you wanna do a position pattern, it makes no difference where the tool was previously sitting, it's gonna drill in what you tell it next. So I defined my starting position. I'm gonna start at the top of my part is zero. I define my depth. So my depth can either be a true depth by tip or a diameter. So if I looked at my print, they wanted me to open up the spot face to a 325 diameter. So that's what I'm gonna give it. And then I can tell it, what do I wanna to do to dwell or pause at the bottom of the hole? In this case, I can control this by either seconds or if I hit the select key, revolutions. And that's pretty handy. Sometimes it's nice instead of thinking, gee, how many seconds do I want to be down hole? You may want just one, one and a half revs of that tool to make sure you don't have a burr, to make sure you don't shallow, shallow position the hole maybe. So you can toggle between revs or seconds. Certainly it makes no difference what they are if you're leaving the value at zero, which I am. So we'll keep the page, hit accept. Now, what just happened? Well, it not only built the string like we have here, but it gave me this mcall command. Had I left this a single position, hit accept, there is no mcall. So that's fundamentally the difference. So what does mcall mean? It means modal drilling, it's a modal call. So it's now telling you that this is going to stay on until you shut me off. And now I'm gonna tell it where I wanna physically drill. So if I looked at my part print real fast, this, these two holes, they're really on a diameter of three. So this is X is zero, Y 1.5, and that's my Y minus 1.5. So now I'm gonna tell it. Now, the system just came out of a tool change. It may not know it's in wrapping mode. I usually will give it at least one rapid command when I get down to these positions. So I'm gonna give it an X zero. I'm gonna give it a Y 1.5. Now in this case, no Z, because Z is all handled at the cycle level. I'm going to give it a Y of minus 1.5. That's gonna handle drilling the lower hole. She's gonna retract back to the retraction position of the cycle level, and it's gonna start feeding from that safety distance. So if my top was zero, and I have a safety of 50 thou, which we had at the cycle level, it means it's gonna feed from 50 thou above the part. Now, whenever we start drilling, we always wanna shut the cycle off before we do some other command. So remember we said it's modal, so modal's gonna stay on until you tell me otherwise. So that's where M call comes in. So a simple M call again, whatever sits between the two M call statements is what this cycle is now going to do. So from here, I can now go into a centering again. Now this is why I'm changing the centering because my starting position is at a new plane. This four hole pattern is a half inch down. So I want to make sure I tell the system minus 0.5. Define it, define diameter, define my spot drill size, hit accept. Now I've got to give it some location. So certainly nobody says I can't just give it a bunch of rapid commands. It'd be easy enough to interpret right off the screen. But I can also start to use these positions screen. So if I'm doing any longhand program at the control, I'm probably gonna to wanna to use the positions. So positions allows me to do four different variants. I can do random holes, I can do arrays, an array can be a simple line, it can be a grid of holes, or it can be a frame of holes. So if you had 100 holes, you could handle it right in this simple grid, you know, giving you a start point, how many in one row, how many in the other row, what's the distance between them, and away she goes. I can also do bolt hole patterns here. So if I'm gonna do a bolt hole pattern, and maybe we'll handle this one as a bolt hole pattern a little later, we could try that. I can do that with this cycle. So I'm gonna use random. And one of the things I am gonna tell it here is I'm gonna fill out the label command. So earlier I had typed in the value outside. This is a reference, so you can put anything you want. For me, it's just saying, hey, I'm gonna call these four holes the outside holes. But once I put the label, now it gives me a way to recall up this that pattern later when I need to redo it. If you notice like in the bolt hole pattern or the array, the label's blank. I can leave the label blank, but then I have no way of recalling up these holes. Tell it the plane, and then really just give it your coordinates. So in this case, I started at the lower right. So there's your plus two and minus one and five eighths. 
and then I moved up. I don't have to repeat the X or repeat the axis that's not moving. I can. It's not going to hurt me. I just said, hey, move up 1 and 5 eighths, move over to the left, minus 2, move down my minus 1 and 6 25 or 1 and 5 eighths, giving me my four holes. So we accept it. Now, keep in mind, this is still modal drilling. So I could have rapid commands, then the cycle. I mean, you can pack a whole bunch of stuff between the two M calls. But remember, you got to put the M call. So now as we start to simulate it, you're going to start to get the drilling. So I'm going to zoom back a little bit. And we'll uh, clean up our tool path. See the round. There's our slot. There's our thread. And now we're going to get into our spot holes really quick. All right, so there we see our four holes get spotted. So what did it do? Well, the new zero planes controlled where it was drilling from. So if you notice every hole looks like the same depth, because they are. The difference is I changed that Z0 to my different planes. Now, I used the same retract location, which was 100 thou above. So what the system does is if there's a large gap between the retract and the Z0 plane, it's still going to wrap it between the two. You're not going to get all these like long feed moves down. So what it'll do is it'll say, okay, well, I know where my safety distance is always, in this case, 50 thou off of my Z0. My Z0 is changing from physical 0 to minus 0.5, so that's why it increased the rapid motion. But still knowing, since you told me I'm going a depth or a spot face of 325, it now knows how deep to drill the holes. Okay, so we're starting to do our drilling. From here, we now have the drill ream. And this is a very popular cycle, and it's an extremely similar strategy to what you just saw on the centering. Um, really, the fundamental difference here is I can do a reaming cycle. So reaming is going to feed down and feed back out of the hole. So if I had a reamer and I don't want to chip the reamer by wrapping out or or scratching up my surface, I would use a reaming cycle. If I use the standard drilling cycle, the fundamental difference between everything you just saw and this cycle is I have tip or now shank. So the drilling cycle is intended to break through a hole as opposed to centering is just spotting the top face of the hole. So in our case here, I can use that cycle maybe on these four outside holes and I can program the, the thickness of the part, and it'll automatically push the drill through the hole by that amount. Now, in our case, we are going to tap some holes here. So I'm going to do a 201 drill, and we'll then go back with a quarter 20 tap and tap these holes. So we'll set it up. We'll set up the cycle, and you'll get a chance to see how I can now use that outside repeat command to keep me from having to go through and put all the locations again, because I'm just going to drill these four outside holes. So this is how it works. You use that label. Well, the label comes in real handy. So remember, I called it outside. So let's do our tool change. Let's go grab a 201 drill. I have one pre-created for us. Now, with the, the, the overrun or the calculation, either case, it's important that we fill out the correct tip angles. So like my spot drill or my center drill knew it had a 90 degree. If it was an 82 or another angle, you want to make sure you fill it. That's how it's calculating properly. In this case, I'm telling it it's a 118 drill. If it was a 135, a 140, make sure you give it if you're letting it calculate. Okay, we'll do our quick tool change, fire up our spindle. I should probably just cut, copy, and paste, save me some time. Now, when drilling, um, I'm not limited, actually, I'm not, not limited anywhere to just running it feed per minute or inches per minute. So, you know, maybe uh, I happen to know that this drill was intended to be running at 5 thou per rev uh, in steel. Here you can do a G95, 5 thou per rev, and now my feed rate will be in feed per rev as opposed to uh, feed per minute. So we're going to go back to drilling. We're going to go to drill ream, and now we're going to start to fill out the page. So like I said before, it's the exact same questions that we just did. Where do I go when I'm done? This is an absolute value. How close do I get incrementally? to whatever sits in Z0, in this case a half an inch down. So this is the difference, tip or shank. 
So shank allows me to program a one inch thick part. Since it's a nose, it's a 118 drill. It's automatically going to push the drill beyond whatever it calculates the tip projection to be. Hit accept, and I got the cycle. Um, if I wanted to ream, I would select the reaming routine, and now I fill out the page, and you'll see very, very common fields. Um, you just have two different feed rates, feed in and feed out. Um, other than that, it's a very traditional strategy. Okay. So we want to do this outside routine again. This is where I can use the position repeat to save me some time. I can just come in, type the name, and it's up to me. Remember to hit input here to get the accept key to make sure that I get the same name that I used up top. There's no there's no checking here. You know, if I typed this to be outside two, let's say, it thinks it's good. It doesn't have enough intelligence to go back and say, well, outside two doesn't exist. So I do need to make sure that I get it correct. All right. Now, whether I'm repeating, whether I'm doing the cycle, I still, just like before, have to remember to shut my drilling off with my M call. Now we're going to go in and we're going to physically see it drill those holes. So I'm going to speed it up a little bit. So with this scenario, and let's just toggle our path off. If I roll it around, I see, oh, there I did. I just broke through. So I told it an inch. It went an inch plus whatever it calculated out this point projection to be based on the diameter and the tip angle. Okay. So again, you'll, you'll notice the cycles themselves, um, a lot of commonality through. Uh, and just these slight nuances really that allow you to take advantage of that cycle in that given feature or function. So for us, really the next step is to now take a look at the peck drilling cycle because let's face it, the peck drilling cycle tends to be what I call the heavy lifter. You know, we use peck drilling all the time. So here, that's what's called our deep hole drilling cycle. So deep hole is going to handle both strategies, and it's all based on my chip removal field that you get just under the pattern. So whether I want a peck drill or use a chip breaker, I can define that here. Okay. So in our case, we're going to use this cycle, and we're going to do the two top holes, and that's the way we're going to drill those two hole strategies. We're going to, we're going to switch to, um, I can just leave the same tool into, for, for simplicity's sake. Uh, the print had us changing to a quarter inch drill. But what we want to do is we want to come in, and we want to take a look in detail at the cycle 83 cycle. And I'm going to use the bolt hole pattern just to show you a slightly different variation of handling the two top holes. So when I come in, I'm going to, and let me bring my print up so you guys can keep an eye on that. We're going to, we're going to drill these two holes. And I'll just use the tool that we already have in the system. So I have my 201 drill. So I want to pick the deep hole drilling cycle. So again, very common variables, plane, retract, safety, am I doing multiples or not? But now we have chip breaker or chip removal. So chip removal is going to pull the drill out of the hole each peck. Chip breaker is going to take the tool and just back up enough to break the chip, but not physically pulling the tool out of the hole. So really that's up to you. Um, certainly if I have through pressure coolant, um, through spindle coolant, high pressure through spindle coolant, I'm not going to want to pull the tool out of the hole. I want to keep it engaged and maybe just break the chip to reduce the stringers. Um, if I don't have any through spindle coolant, then you're probably going to want to pull out of the hole because you're pretty much cutting dry once you start to engage that tool. So you're going to want to pull it out. So there's a lot of factors as to why you would choose one or the other. So in this case, say we'll do um, chip removal. Now you'll notice as you pick them, you get different variants or options that all start to come into play. And we have our starting position. We have how do we want to handle the depth shank or tip, so it's just like you saw before. Uh, in my case, that hole doesn't go all the way through. Uh, the print says that this hole only goes down 5 eighths of an inch, so we told it to go 5 eighths of an inch. You tell it what your peck amount is. Now, if you think there's more options here, remember, hit the select key, so I can do an absolute or an incremental, but this is the first depth. 
Okay, so just keep that in mind. That's why everything's writing up, lighting up red right now with absolute, because obviously my first step would need to be into my part, so it has to be a negative if I'm, if I'm absolute. If I'm an incremental, it knows the direction it's going, so it's fine. Now we have a couple options. So here is my feed for my first pet depth, and then my, de my depth percentage increment. So what I can do is I could maybe reduce my feed rate, slow it down on this first 250 pec. So that would say, hey, you know, whatever we were running at, uh, we think we were doing 5,000 per rev, it would run half of that for the first pec. And then I can start to reduce my pec depth. So if you get into like a deep hole scenario where I'm really sending the drill far in the hole, I may not want to do 250 every single pec. So this is a percentage of the previous pec. So, you know, let's say easy numbers. I had a pec depth of 0.1 and I used 90. That means the first pec would be 100 thou, second pec would be 90 thou, third pec would be 90% of the last one, and it just keeps decrementing it by that percentage. In the scenario when I'm using this, a new variable comes up, right? So I have my percentage and then I have my V1 retract. So in this case, it's yelling at me because my V1 retract certainly can't be, well, this is, I'm sorry, this is not my retract. This is my minimum pec depth. So what will happen is it's reducing, reducing, reducing the pec. At some point in time, it doesn't want to get to a point where the pec depth is almost infinite. So here you control the minimum amount. Now, this is case, it's saying, hey, your minimum is greater than your first pec depth. So we're not going to allow that. So had I changed this to maybe 50 thou, it'll keep kicking the pec depth down until it gets to 50, and then use a constant pec from then on out. Okay. If I'm using... Using 100, that variable doesn't mean anything, so I can leave it alone. I thought I was using 100 for my feed, I'm fine. My retract, I can do automatic or I can tr control what the retract value is. So depending on how much I want it to back up while I'm in the chip removal function. And then you can control some different dwells. So I can control a dwell at the first pec depth. I can control a dwell at the bottom and I can control a del dwell when starting. So there's a bunch of different conditionals. Nobody's ever gonna remember all these different variations. So this is a great example of where I would wanna hit the help screen, go in and start to dig into these different variations and commands. And these are some of the things that you start to see where the G code starts to outperform conversational because we have even more variants or vari variations of the cycles in G-code than you even get conversational. So um, we tend to say, you know, conversational is great for quick programming, fast at the control, uh, but if you want to gain a little bit more control over your toolpath, that's where the G-code side really shines, the program guide side. So we fill out the cycle, hit accept. I have a two-hole bolt pattern to do. So I'm going to jump over to my position screens. I'll just do a simple bolt hole. Center is zero, zero. I'm not going to use any label. And then we'll tell it a radius and how many holes I want to do. So in this case, I'm doing a two hole bolt pattern. Hit accept, give it my M call. And we're off and drilling. Now, from there, we do want to talk about tapping. So we're going to jump over to that real quick. I know we're uh, we're hitting up against the wall here on time. There is a lot of content in this webinar. I think sometimes I tend to get a little overzealous. Um, we talked about boring briefly, but this just gives you a little bit more of an example. So you get into this lift or no lift strategy field, and that's how I can control what the boring part does at the bottom of the hole. Now tapping, tapping is pretty interesting because tapping gives us a lot of different options. So not only can I do a traditional rigid or soft tap, but we also support these integral drill thread mill tools. So where the same tool drills the hole and then thread mills the hole and pulls out all in one shot. So we have an optimized cycle called drill thread milling built right into the control. We're gonna use the tapping cycle, um, but certainly this is something to take a look at. It's a very, very powerful cycle. Now in tapping, we have a couple options. I can rigid tap or soft tap, and that's with this with or without compensating chuck that we're gonna see. If I'm rigid tapping, I can do pack tapping or just straight tapping. 
all filled out right from this same given cycle. Now, once you've set up all this, I'm going to still link it like an M call uh, and do the positions that I'm going to, to, to drive it to right in the program. So you're going to see I'm going to have my M call statement. I'm going to tell it where do I want to go. In this case, I'll repeat the outside, and then I'm going to physically go in and end up in the program. So we'll jump back, start finishing the program, and we're going to tap some holes. So let's make sure here we change our tool, because in this case, it's kind of important that we put the right tap in. Now, when building the tap, just be careful with the pitch field here, because this is going to be dependent on whatever unit of measure the control is sitting in, not the part program I'm writing. Because remember, this is our offset table. So the trick is, if the machine's an inch, this value is threads per inch, no matter how you're defining the pitch physically in the part program. If the machine's in metric, this is a metric pitch, right? So one mil, two mil, one and a half mil. Um, so fundamental difference between how we spec taps an inch and how we spec taps in metric. So just make sure you pay attention to that. If you get it wrong, there's an error track check and it'll tell you the incorrect tool type. And that's generally what it means. Okay, so we got a tap. We put it in the spindle, we fire up our spindle some RPM. Uh, I'm just going to put her back to standard feed per minute mode. Um, certainly the tapping cycle itself will ha handle what the uh, speed of the tap is going to be. We're going to jump over to drill, jump over to thread. So these are those two cycles I meant. So here is the drill thread mill site optimized cycle, or we have our tapping cycle. Tapping is going to use, again, very similar variables to what you've seen. The difference now is I can tell it whether I'm rigid or soft tapping. So in our control, we refer to rigid as without a compensating chuck. With a compensation, compensating chuck would be soft tapping. So that would be a floating tap holder, not reversible, just one of those tension compression floating tap holders. You're using a floating tap holder, you're going to get soft tapping. We, have, we tell it we're not using a floating tap holder. Um, traditionally here, it's really what your machine was commissioned for. Um, if you have a machine that doesn't have encoder feedback on the spindle, then you can't rigid tap, then you'll be using with a compensating chuck. Um, if you have it, you're probably always going to want a rigid tap, even if you had a floating uh, tension compression holder in the physical machine to take out for any maybe um, performance issues the machine tool may have. Okay. So we give it an M call. We're going to give it our position pattern, right? So before, where do I start? Where do I end? I'm giving it a little bit of over on the tap. Is it a right hand or a left hand tap? I can use the table if I want to define my thread by the table. Or like before, when we were doing the thread milling cycle, I can use my select key and toggle between a module pitch thread, a metric pitch thread, an inch pitch thread or the threads per inch. So even if I was doing a metric pitch right here, I still, since the, the machine's in, in inch, I still would have to define the physical threads per inch to be an inch value. Um, it doesn't have to be a whole number. So if this was a metric tap, I would just calculate what the equivalent of that would be an inch for threads per inch, and that's what I would put in the offset table when I built the tool. In our case, we're going to use 20 matches the physical tool. Where do I want the starting position of the thread to be? What is my speed into my part? And later you'll see we can control the speed out. Now this is pretty unique. Not a lot of controls give you the ability of chip breaker or chip removal when tapping. So if I want to do traditional rigid tapping, I do one cut. And that'll feed all the way down and pull out. But if I did want a chip breaker or chip removal, I then pick those. And here now I get a pecking. How do I want to retract? What's my retract value? It's a few different things. So for our case, just for how to, to streamline this, we'll just do one cut, dwell at the bottom of the hole if I want to flush some coolant out, and then how do I want to retract out of the hole? Um, if you have a very, very fast spindle, I can start to increase my speed out a lot quicker than I speed in, saving me tapping time. Final question is what do I want to do when I get to the end of the hole? I accept it. We're going to tell it where we're going to drill, so I'm just going to copy and paste these two final commands, and we will be done with our program. I know we're running a little long here. I thank you for everybody that's hanging on with me. There's a lot of material. So let's copy this 
and paste it. So aside from maybe adding some safety retracts and whatnot, we should have a complete part. So we'll give it one final simulation. And there was just a couple points uh, for those of you guys that want to hang on. There's a couple of things I did want to talk about a little bit beyond this. So I'll continue on. And if you guys want, please feel free to hang on. If you have to go, I totally understand. Uh, and thank you for, uh, for joining. And Maybe you might want to take a look at the recording to see what you missed. But there's just a couple things I want to talk specifically about these cycles. So there we go around with drilling, center drilling. Here's your peck drilling cycle, and there's our final tapping cycle. Okay, now go back to the PowerPoint deck. The cycles themselves are, are, are great being able to use the data mask when I'm working on programs I'm programming longhand. But what happens if we're going to do programming um, physically from a CAD CAM package? Well, the key here is really understanding what the cycle string means. And unfortunately, a lot of times, when I look at the physical cycle, I don't have any idea what field is feeding what variable in the string. So what we did is we created a physical manual that would break down the cycle based on the, the comma delimited variable. And we say comma delimited, meaning there's just a comma between them. So you don't have the I, J, Ks, E, B, Ws, and all the, the, uh, the physical letter designations of the variable here because we have the cycle mask conversational. But for those guys trying to methodize a po post, that becomes challenging. So what we've done is we've created a cycle manual that will spell out the entire cycle. So anybody that's dealing with this stuff that uh, would like to get a copy of the cycle manual, by all means, shoot me an email. I'd be happy to share with you. But what it does, and it does this for all the milling cycles, everything we've looked at today, um, it will break down those cycles into each variable and what each variable means. So some of this stuff is a direct correlation. So you see the RP, which is our retract field here conversational, in the cycle string is represented by the RTP, which is right over here, our RTP. So I see the first variable, point 0.1, point 0.1. Now, some of this stuff gets a little confusing. That's why I wanted to take a second to point this out. When you start to look at areas that have multiple place variables, right? So like I have this, this G mode, this underscore G mode. So I can define whether I want to be in a depth or a diameter, let's say, or that was for cycle 81. Um, or maybe I want to control what my tool plane mode is with D mode, or I want to control what happens um, based on a few different conditions. I have this A mode. So it works a little bit backwards in the way we describe it here. So it's units, tenths. So when you look at the value, like let's say we go to the ninth place, A mode. Well, A mode is going to tell me a couple different things. It's going to tell me, is my depth being controlled? This is my Z1 right here, being controlled by an absolute or an incremental value. And also, how are we controlling the dwell time at the bottom? Is it in seconds or in revs? So you see how I said the first one is units, the second one is tenths? That means that the first one to the right is my, my units place. My tenths place would be my next place to the left. You know, I think sometimes we always tend to want to work from the left to right. So, so I look at this and I would expect, well, gee, I'm expecting seconds and I, and I, I have a, you know, the wrong value here. Well, that's because everything's working backwards. So if you look, the first one, number two, is this first place to the right. That gives me absolute. Next one to the left is my tenth place. A value of one is seconds. Sure enough, I'm in seconds, not revs. So I had, I had a value of 22 here. It would still be absolute, but it would be revolutions for dwell time, not seconds. So, so again, reach out to me if you'd like to get a copy of this manual. If you guys do any post work or just trying to debug these cycles at all, um, this is pretty much invaluable when getting to trying to decode some of that stuff. Um, final section, I did want to briefly talk about fourth axis parts. Um, really, just to denote the difference you're going to see between G-code and uh, shop mill when you use some of these standard cycles. Um, so if you guys have a second, here we have a very simple part program where we're just machining a couple flats. 
drilling some holes and doing a um, cylinder surface transformation, which you call it, where we're wrapping a profile. Well, the big difference here, um, certainly I have the support stimulation in the, in the clamping section, which I showed you guys earlier, but what you don't have in G-code that you're used to in conversational is A-axis support in the position screens. So really the big thing here is just going to be if you, if you need to handle in G-code drilling with a rotary table of some type, whether it's a five-axis machine or a four-axis, the position locations are going to have to be broken down into more of the basic uh, positional points, and then I can give it the physical angular values. And that's the same in the can cycles, too. So you'll see some of the can cycle support in shop mill allows you to pre-position the rotary axis. Here, you would pre-position the model and then get into it. Um, same thing holds true when you get into the cylinder surface transformation function. Uh, and I have talked about this a little bit in some earlier webinars. This function allows me the ability of programming a two-dimensional shape, and then it'll wrap it around the physical cylinder. Now, it is an option. It does require this option you see on the bottom of the screen, transmit and peripheral surface transformation. Uh, but it's really handy if I want to do any two-dimensional surfaces and wrap them around. And, and that holds true for not only milling machines, but lathes as well, lathes with live tooling. You'll see this option used quite a bit. So just to show you briefly what I was talking about here, I did pre-create this program. The program will machine that same part that you just saw. So it's going to machine a few flats. So there's my three cycles. I did that with the facing cycle. Here I used a simple pocketing cycle, but I turned on the cylinder surface transformation function. There we're drilling a couple holes and drilling a bolt hole pattern around our peripheral. So if we look at the tool path, what I did for the pocketing cycle, I just pre-staged the A. So nothing within the, or the facing cycle in this case, shall I say, nothing within this cycle has any reference to the A axis. So what it will do is it will just use the A axis wherever it was previously sitting. So by simply pre-positioning the A, the X, Y, Z is just putting the tool in a safe location for the spin. That's the only reason why I, I repeat those. But really the key here is I pre-position the A and then drew my tool path. Position my A again, do my tool path. Now in this case, I'm positioning, clocking the A back to zero because we're going to use the cylinder surface trans, which is triggered by a command called TRACEL. Uh, it's transformation about a cylinder. That's what TRACEL stands for. So the way this works is you're going to tell it the diameter I'm wrapping about. So this part, this little part, was actually a, a four-inch diameter. Um, there's a radius of two-inch there. So what I'm saying is, hey, whatever comes next, wrap it around a four-inch radius. Now what's important here, you always want to watch, is where did you leave Y? Because Y is going to be transposed in a mill to A-axis position moves. If this was a lathe, it would be C-axis moves. So I have a Y value here in my part program once I turn this on, but this is using these Y values, and then the width that would normally be applying to the Y is actually being transposed to A-axis motion. So you have to make sure you pre-stage the physical Y before you go into cylinder surface transformation or everything can start to look shifted on you. So we turn it on, we do our basic pocket, it wraps it around the bar, and then you'll see as my drilling's concerned, since I didn't have any kind of support in the position cycle for a rotary, I have to give it these straight moves. Um, that's as a teaser alert, that's one of the things that's coming in 4.7 that you'll see in the next webinar. Okay, so we covered a lot of content. We ran over a little bit. Uh, I see a lot of guys hung on there. I thank you very much. Um, I am certainly going to uh, hang on for some questions, but I am going to stop the recording. So give me one second to stop that. Okay.